normally I'd rather read one verse so you don't, you don't get overwhelmed by too many scriptures right at the start. And uh, later we could read some verses. But the one verse I want to read is actually a prayer that I want to pray. And if I read just one verse, then I need to pray. But I need to explain the prayer before I pray. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> so what I was thinking about the believers that I've met re just yesterday and, and this morning and some of you all that I know, and I feel like we would be okay to read, read a few verses. Like... And even as we read, like, who knows what will happen? Because all of this is up to the Lord revealing himself in us. And, and he does things. This is probably the most exciting uh, thing on my heart right now is that <clears throat> what we may see is beyond what, what I've seen. Or what you may receive as we are in the word together is, is up to the Lord and doesn't depend on uh, a limitation of, of uh, even the, the speaker. But, so even if, as we read the word of God, if our hearts are open to the Lord, like words of God can speak to us, and he can reveal to us things that it means, even without someone making it plain and clear to us. But anyway, yesterday we did, we did st kind of major a little bit on Ephesians 3, 8, and how... The Apostle Paul was given grace to, to share the gospel with the nations. But he says to share the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ. Uh, now, I'm a little bit sorry, not sorry, that I just exploded too much last night and shared way too many things. And, and so we talked a little bit about God's eternal purpose and about some of these mysteries and some of these scriptures we read. But because our point wasn't to try to nail that down and get it all clear, it was more just to see that even at the very beginning, when you get the gospel, when you receive Christ, you are receiving the, these unsearchable riches of Christ. And this whole package of God's purpose is purposed in Christ. So it, that was just the amazing thing that I wanted to get across last night. And I know a lot of side things probably either lost us or you're just like, whoa, like I need to think about that. Because that's how I felt. It's like, yes. Um, and and so, so right now, I would like to get into a little bit of, of these terms and what, what some of this means. Hopefully maybe to, to add some language to, to be able to say, like if someone asks you, what is God's eternal purpose? Like, what is this mystery that we're reading about right here? Now, in one sense, what we're learning is, we, we, may, we may always feel a little bit like, I can't quite explain it because it's unsearchable, because it's beyond me. And, but in another sense, these are mysteries that are meant to be revealed right now. Oh, also, I wanted to apologize to the translator last night. Whoever, that, that guy was going, going at it. I don't know if you guys saw him in the back. He was like very expressive. I don't know why. That was you? Oh, so fast. I was like, there's no way he got that, but then you got it. That was cool. That was just so cool. All right, so, so let's read this a little bit. And what I want to get to is some of these terms that come up, and then also there's a prayer that flows out of the sharing of God's purpose. So, so let's notice this. Verse 8, if you have Bibles and you're in Ephesians 3, 8, to me less than the least of all saints has this grace been given to announce among the nations the glad tidings or the gospel of the unsearchable riches of the Christ, and to enlighten all with the knowledge of what is the administration of the mystery hidden throughout the ages in God, or some translations might say in eternity, and who has created all things in order that now to the principalities and authorities in the heavenlies might be made known through the church the all various wisdom of God, according to the purpose of the ages. Or in some translations, it'll say, according to the eternal purpose. So this is where we might get that phrase, the eternal purpose. According to the purpose of the ages, which he has purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access and confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I beseech you not to faint through my tribulation for you, 
which is your glory. And remember, he's in he's in uh, in jail. Um, uh, and <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> and then starts this prayer. And it's for this reason. The reason is all that he just mentioned about God's purpose of the ages and him sharing this this purpose and making it known. Um, and so he says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom every family in the heavens and on earth is named in order that he may give you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power. So notice this prayer. <clears throat> now it's a prayer to be strengthened with power in the inner man, to be strengthened with power by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell through faith in your hearts, being rooted and founded in love. So there's a prayer here that you would actually gain the spiritual strength to do this, to be about this, to like take the, the steps or the, the works that God has prepared ahead of time for you to walk in. This is his prayer right now. Um, so you're rooted and founded in love in order that you may be fully able to apprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. This is like the breadth and length and depth and height of what? It seems like this, this experience of the love of God with the saints that you're able to apprehend this. Now, this is a little bit different than just to understand this. This is like to walk in it. You're strengthened in the inner man. You've got the Holy Spirit, like we, we read in, in chapter one yesterday. I think, oh, actually, we didn't even read it. Um, we're about to read in a second. But you, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit deep inside. But there's like an overflow that he's praying would happen, that Christ would not only dwell in you spiritually, but he would overflow to the very, the very like rooms of your heart. So, you know, like, like, like you, you may have your own mind, but now like you're discovering the mind of Christ. You may have your own will, but now it's being conformed to the will of, of the Lord. And, uh, and so anyway, Christ is almost like, almost like in the temple where the Holy of Holies has the presence of God. But because the curtain has been torn, that presence of God overflows outside of the deepest part into the next room. It's kind of like that with a Christian. Like, even though the Holy Spirit dwells in our spirits, like, he's meant to flow beyond and actually just, just, just dwell through faith in your hearts, actually. Not just deep within, not just hidden within. Anyway, so, so you would be able to apprehend this and to know the love of the Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled even to all, all the fullness of God. All right, now that's a prayer. And then right after this prayer, you have the next chapters. And he kind of begins, like in chapter 4, like we need like a call to walk worthy of this calling. Now, all these other three chapters, he's been showing us this extremely high calling. This is the highest calling possible. Like our calling as the church is to display all these things that God had purposed from the ages. And not only to display it between us and God, but even to the unseen realm, even to the angels and so on. I mean, it's almost like to explain the, the calling, it took those three chapters, but now he prays, you get strengthened, and you start to walk in this. And then the first thing he gets into is, is us with the church together and how we walk together and we stick together and we grow together. But then he gets into really specific things like, like how you are with your, with your spouse or how you are with your children or how you are, uh, I mean, you could, you could uh, borrow it and say how you are at work almost, even though it's talking about slaves and masters. But um, and <clears throat> so that's a right prayer, and that's a right focus. Now, I believe sometimes we want to get right to that, and we want to get right to the spot of, like, let's do this. And, uh, but with, with God, sometimes there's a moment or a need to kind of come up with him to a high mountain and just waste some time with the Lord. And so there's an earlier prayer in the book of Ephesians. It's almost like when you're studying Ephesians, you could separate the book by these two prayers. There's a couple of prayers, and really the prayer we just read, even though it's an overflow of like this revelation of the purpose of God, it's a prayer, and then he kind of instructs you how to do it if you've been strengthened in the inner man, if you've been strengthened by, by his spirit, and he's, his love starts to flow into your heart. Now, what are you going to do? So that's like this, the last part of, of Ephesians. 
But the first part is all of this amazing discoveries of the riches of his grace, of the riches in Christ. It's a lot of discovery. So I want to I want to go back to chapter one. And I'm still going to pray, remember, so this is just a lot of verses to read. <coughs> Sorry, I'm coughing. I'm not contagious. I just have this um, lingering uh, cough. All right, so let's, let's uh, skip to, you know, last night we were just, it's like you can't, you, can't, um, you can't even go two verses and not see something about his will right here and not see something that's just grand. So after, after what we talked about where you're accepted in the beloved and, and you've also, um, in, in Christ, you've got the redemption in his blood, the forgiveness of your offenses. Like right after that, in verse 9, we just kind of barely read this, but I want to read on. Uh, I know some of us weren't there last night, but we kind of backtracked a little bit to see like that salvation that we know of is embedded in this great will of God that was his will and his choice before the foundation of the world happened. So he, we were chosen in him before that. So that's, that's in the earlier verses. But verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. Now, one reason I'm reading this is I want us to catch these terms, that they're biblical terms. They're right here in the scriptures, and there's something on God's heart. So here we have the mystery of his will, but he says, having made known to us the mystery of his will. Uh, I think I've already mentioned this, but we've got to remember this, like mysteries of God sometimes in the Bible get sealed up. Like if you read in the book of, um, of Daniel, he sees something and he's like, what? And then God's like, go ahead and seal that one up because it's for a later age. Uh, it's just amazing. Like Daniel, sometimes God would say, all right, so this beast is this nation and so on. But or, or the, this one's Babylon, and this one, and sometimes he's explaining to Daniel, and Daniel even explains to others, but, you know, some of it's just sealed up, and it's for another time. And maybe you see it kind of unlocked in the book of Revelation, especially. Some of Daniel's stuff just comes alive there and is explained. But there's some mysteries of God that we just don't know. Like, there's a really cool part in Revelation where there's these seven thunders, and there's something that they say. And then and then John knows what they said, and he's about to write it down. But God's like, no, no this, is, this is a mystery not to be revealed. So, so we don't have all these. But the mystery of his will was hidden. He kept it hidden. But then as Christ died on the cross, and Christ rose from the dead, and as Christ appeared to others, and then as he ascended, and then as he poured out his spirit upon the church, suddenly this mystery that's been in God's heart has been revealed. And, and in a way, the disciples, even as Jesus rose from the dead, they, they had been taught so much for a few years while they were walking with him. You would think like they get what's going on, but it still was like an unraveling. So even though they saw stuff, it was unraveling. We can see it unravel in the New Testament, like in the book of Acts. You see like they're seeing something more, and then they see a little bit more. So you see things like, Actually, what, what we didn't get into in Ephesians 3, Paul makes a very big deal about there's no, no break anymore with the Jews and the Gentiles. There's no more middle wall of partition. There's no more division there. There's one new man now. This is a big deal. This is the gospel that he's able to preach of the unsearchable riches of Christ, that it's all finished in Christ. That was a major revelation of the mystery of God. That suddenly what, what had been all split up in the whole world has all like been done away with at the cross. And in Christ, there's just no division. Now, you, with us in America, <clears throat> it's often like a no, there's no thought about this being a big issue. But I, I think what you can do is see the largest division in, among mankind that's ever been out there is the division that God created. when. The Tower of Babel, Babel happened, the babbling that happened at the Tower of Babel. Um, when that happened, and all these 70 nations got all split up, they're all kind of named by their families, and they all divide out. And then God said, I'm going to make one nation. And he grabs Abraham. God made a major division that, there. And he had the Israel, and then he had what he called nations. It's just everybody that rejected God. And then he had one nation in Israel. It's a major division. It's like 
everybody, and then the people of God. So this, of all divisions, this is like the unbreakable division because God himself created it. And it seems like all through those ages, everything has to do with Israel. You can either you know, jump in or not. But then suddenly when the, when the good news comes, like that, even that part of the mystery just gets unraveled in Christ. And you see like it's, it's just done away with. But anyway, the mystery of his will is made known. So that was just barely made known to Peter in the book of Acts. And he kind of sees something and, uh, and he responds to it and he obeys what he saw. So that, that was something where, you know how last night we were talking about God sending someone like in Romans 10 and they have beautiful feet and they get sent and they share the good news. And I was mentioning how you may not even know how good the good news is that you're sharing. You just barely got started or you may be like the Apostle Paul. And as you share the good news, you know that the unsearchable riches of Christ are coming out of your mouth, even though all you're telling them is, that Jesus died on the cross and that he was buried and that he rose from the dead. But something major is being shared. So Peter barely knew what he was doing. He just knew like, he's a disciple. He's, Jesus is his Lord and he has this dream and it's a weird dream and he's pretty hungry and it's a bunch of food that he's not supposed to eat and God's telling him to eat it. But anyway, God didn't, God didn't, God wanted to save Cornelius, this Gentile and all of his family, his household and his others. And he sent him an angel but the angels are not meant to be those messengers of the gospel. They can in a rare time, it seems like. like Actually, in one sense, you could say with the shepherds at the birth of Jesus, angels showed up and they gave some great news about the birth of the Messiah. But in general, even if an angel shows up to Cornelius, you know what he does? He says, go and fetch Simon Peter. And here's the house where he's at, Simon the Tanner's house. So that's what happened because God wanted some beautiful feet of Peter. Peter's feet, they walk and they come and they show up and then he starts talking and then suddenly, despite himself, as just good news of Jesus comes out and despite his understanding about can Gentiles even be saved, just the Lord saves them. And, and I, that's just like another example of God sending us even though we have no idea what we're talking about. Peter is not saying, now the middle wall of partition is broken and we're about to baptize you guys, whoever's willing to believe. He's not at all there. He's not even sure they could ever be saved or be baptized. He's just like, all right, God sent me here. And you guys know I don't normally eat meals with uh, Gentiles, right? I actually normally don't even step in your tent or your house. And he's like, but here I am. And so then he starts talking. And then they just, they believe. And then the Holy Spirit comes upon them like at Pentecost. And you know, that unsearchable riches of Christ includes all this stuff. And even though Peter, he's not telling them all this stuff, God is unleashing all this stuff beyond what Peter let them know about. And then it just explodes among them. And then Peter's like looking at the other Jews and he's like, how can we not baptize them? And that, that's kind of his story. And then even when he gets back to the Jews and they're all like, what just happened? And, and Peter's just like, well, let me just tell you my story. So in the book of Acts, it's like, you got to read the whole story again because he repeats every word for word almost. And then he tells the whole story. And he's like, and then we just, it's like, we had to baptize them because they got, they got the Holy Spirit poured up, out upon them. And then everybody was like, okay, yeah, that, that's true. Um, <clears throat> you know, but by the time you get to the Apostle Paul, and, and uh, you know, on his journey to, on his way to Jerusalem, like that verse I read, I read last night in Acts 20, 24, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's going to get bound up. You know, the big issue in Jerusalem was he had some Gentile believers with him. And they made up a thing like he was bringing them beyond the middle wall of partition. He was bringing them into the courts, into the temple. But that's not what he was actually doing. It was just like they were saying this. But his big issue, why he got arrested, why he ends up in jail, all of that stuff, the Jews made a big fuss because in the church, there's no Jew or Gentile. And Paul really saw this. But you know that mystery was unraveling to him. It was a, it was a treasure of Christ that he was discovering. And the church in Jerusalem had just barely like touched it. And so he gets there and James, the brother of Jesus, is like, See how zealous everybody is for the law? See these Pharisees that got saved? Now, can you, like, just to show them that you really are a Jew, can you go ahead and, and like, pay their vows? And, and uh, you know, and Paul's, like, shaving his head and doing all this stuff. And he's like, and go with them to the temple. He's getting very Jewish for the moment. It's not that I'm not saying he's doing anything wrong, but it's just, like, the believers he was around, that large revelation that is actually pretty simple to us because it's not our issue. It was, like, just barely, like, floating around. 
You know, it was just barely around. Like, they barely let the Gentiles be in the church, it almost seemed like. I mean, when you get to Acts 15, they have a big council. Like, do Gentiles need to keep the law? And they, they, they fellowship and they realize, like, you know, these guys got saved without keeping the law. We got saved without keeping the law. We got saved through Christ. So they, they, don't, they don't put that on them. Anyway, all I want to say is when we're reading the book of Ephesians, and he unloads all this awesome stuff about there being no division between Jews and Gentiles, it is for real a current revelation of the mystery right then. In those few years, it was just exploding. And in his heart, more than others, it was like abounding. So what we know about it, it was fresh. It was brand new. Even though he had been a believer for some time, even though he kind of knew this stuff, he had been preaching to the Gentiles. He had been preaching to the Ephesians. But through that whole experience, it was like he saw more and more, and he saw it all in Christ. He saw the one new man, and he saw it. It was just so, so wonderful. All right, back to this verse. I'm sorry, we still haven't even got to the prayer. For the <laughs> Verse 10, Ephesians 1. For the administration of the fullness of times, to head up all things in the Christ. Or some translations will say, to sum up all things in the Christ. Such a good verse here. The things in the heavens and the things upon the earth. In him in whom we have also obtained an inheritance, being marked out beforehand according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will. Now, do you hear all these purposes and wills and mysteries and all of this stuff that he's saying? Just remember to catch this terminology. All this stuff that he's doing, and as he's summing up all things in the heavens and the earth, and he's summing them all, all up in the Christ, it's according to this old purpose, to this, this um, the, even the inheritance that we've obtained, it's, and we're marked out ahead of time, long ahead of time, like we read. It's like way back when, before the world was created. Even though that's going on, it's according to his purpose that, um, <laughs> sorry, that he is working everything according to the counsel of his own will that we should be to the praise of his glory who have pre-trusted in the Christ. All right, we're getting there, you guys. We're almost there. Um, in whom also, having believed, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He is the earnest of our inheritance to the redemption of the acquired possession to the praise of his glory. Just imagine this. Like this, Now, this verse has been special to me because I... I, I found it when I discovered I have the Holy Spirit inside of me. Major revelation of the riches of his grace right there. Just to know, like, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. This is how God will never leave you nor forsake you. But when it's talking about this seal of the Holy Spirit being inside of us, he's the earnest of this promise of this, this future um, to come, this will of God that he's going to accomplish. He's like going to make sure that this possession God's taken hold of is going to come, go make it all the way through. You will be there and you will be conformed to the image of Christ. You will be to the praise of his glory because you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. It is impossible for you to not shine the glory of Christ in the end because what God has purposed and what you've received when you received Christ as you received Christ, the Holy Spirit came inside of you. And he's the earnest. He's the one like bringing us all the way through to there. So, so like, like, um, like in Philippians 1, like he who began a good work in you, as he's creating you in Christ Jesus, he who began a good work in you, he's not going to stop until he brings it to completion. He's going to do this. It's just glorious. All right. Now, after all this, all this, I think it's like, I think it's like an explosion that happens with the Apostle Paul. Now, I know he sat down and knew what he was going to write. But I also know when you read it, this guy forgot to use periods. He like, he like needs to stop sometimes just to take a breath. If you're doing this like an audio book, you're just like, like, you know. But he's just like one of those guys who'd be like, hold his breath and then go. And he can, like, have you ever tried that? Sometimes I would read a book to my kids and I could read like a Dr. Seuss book with one breath, maybe two. It's like that, and if, especially Ephesians chapter one, even it's like, like check out your, trans now some translations might've cheated and they're like, okay, let's add a period here because this is hard, but actually it's not like that. It's like a flow and a flow. He's like, and by the way, it's like, it's like this, it's like this. And I think that was God's purpose. I mean, that was God's desire as this was being written is because he's showing us the explosion of Christ that happens when you touch God's eternal purpose because everything's there and suddenly you're lifted into something way beyond 
just the, the normal basics that are all included there, but now you're like touching something that's everything. All right, so after all that's shared, he says, verse 15, this is really what I wanted to read today, okay? <laughs> Wherefore also, I also, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which is in you, and the love which you have towards all the saints, I do not cease giving thanks for you, making mention of you at my prayers. Here's his prayer. That the God, I'm in verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the full knowledge of him, that you'd be enlightened in the eyes of your heart, so you should know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of the might of his strength. And then he just, he just keeps going. I've got to stop because we, we got to get into this. But it's like there's just a flow and a flow and a flow. But here's his prayer. Like that we would get the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That God would like open up the eyes of our hearts. And we would see something. And as we see it, it's like we would be, we would not only see him, but we would see the riches of his inheritance in the saints, in the church. Because it's like, it's like you see him, but then you see more of him when you see him in the church. You see, like, we've been seeing, it, even right when you first get saved, you don't, even know, you don't even know where it's all going, but you know, like, I just saw some riches of his grace. We've been seeing riches and riches and riches, and all of these riches are the, um, the unsearchable riches of Christ. But we're getting riches of his grace, like something I can actually explain, like I'm forgiven of my sins. But here he's saying, what about the riches of his inheritance? What about what God is actually gaining in the church and the riches that he's finding or creating or discovering in, in his believers? Like this is an inheritance, not my inheritance in Christ, but this is God's inheritance in the saints. It's just crazy how this is said. All right, now I'd like to pray that we actually, that the Lord reveals to us. Because even though we're talking and we're getting terms and we're going to try to explain things and maybe even simplify so we can have some, some language to this. What's needed, though, even though he just unloaded all this stuff, he's like, and you all are doing it. You've got the love going on, and you all are walking with the Lord, but I'm praying that you would have revelation, that, that in all that you've got, that the Lord would make you wise into this mystery, that something would, would click, and the light would shine, and the eyes of your heart would open up, so you'd see something beyond just your own salvation. So let's pray together. Our Lord, with delight and joy right now in my heart and our hearts, just contemplating these things, just so glad to be with your saints where you have inheritance. Just so glad to be here right now, even having your word opened. Our Lord, we pray, we pray just even according to what we read, that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation right now. That you would open up the eyes of our hearts, that you would open us up beyond what we know, beyond what our minds comprehend, that we would see you, that we would see you on the throne, that we would see you, and we would see your glorious uh, riches, that we would see something beyond. Lord, we pray that you would give us revelation. We pray that the clouds would ro roll back and you would make known to us your son. Father, we pray that you would meet us right now and that whether it's in a small way or a major way, Lord, we want to see Jesus. So we, we quiet our hearts and we fix our attention on the leader and the completer of our faith, the Lord Jesus. Lord, we hear your call to behold him, to behold the Lamb of God who has taken away our sins. And Lord, we fix our hearts on him. We fix our minds on him. We fix our gaze on him. Enlighten us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, revelation is, is, is like a term in the Bible, but it's a reality that is just essential with us believers. And it has happened to you. God has revealed something to you, whether you, we understand it at first or not. For example, when the, when the Apostle Paul is talking about his salvation in, in Galatians 1, he said, it, it, it pleased God to reveal his son in me. And there was a revealing of Christ, and he saw Christ. 
Now, in his case, we could say, like, this isn't fair because actually heaven literally, like, rolled back and he saw Jesus like the real guy. And it was so real that even the guys who didn't see Jesus, they saw light. And it was so real what he heard that even the guys who didn't hear any words, they heard noise, like scary noise. You know, he was with some unbelievers. They were all unbelievers about to kill some Christians. So him and his murderous band, you know, they're doing it legally, though. You know, they're, bringing, they're getting them persecuted in jail. And if they don't, if they don't you know, reject Christ, they, they might die. Um, so all these guys, they don't know what happened, but they heard noise. They saw light. And then Paul is, Saul is blind. So, yeah, he was definitely, some revelation came. So the eyes of his heart were opened up, but also his, like, literal eyes were shut at the same time. It was, like, just, just a picture-perfect situation. But he doesn't describe it that way because he describes in Galatians 1, like just in the way that happens to all of us, that God reveals his son in us. Or if you think about Peter, when, uh, when you get to Matthew 16, Peter says, Jesus is asking them, like, who do you all say that I am? And Peter ends up saying, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, you're so, you're blessed. You're blessed because... No one can teach you this. No one can make this known to you. This revelation only comes by the Father. God has revealed this to Peter. So when revelation comes, it's something that God the Father does. Now, the nice thing is that the Father delights to show his Son. The Father wants to reveal his Son. If our hearts are willing, if we're open to it, he will reveal Christ to us. In some, in some uh, cases, there's these large revelations in the Bible. Like I mentioned, like, well, it might be a salvation revelation that's really large. Um, but there's also just the Lord's minor or normal, maybe you could say almost daily or regular, like, insights. And these are just little tiny bits of, of clouds rolling back, and we see a little bit of Christ. Sometimes as you're in his word, um, you discover just a little piece of Christ. Now, technically, that's a, a taste of revelation, and God delights to do this. It doesn't have to be something weird or some like big thing or something physical or audible or anything. In a normal way, without us using the term, there's a, there's a, a basic kind of God's revealing uh, and what we eventually catch is that whatever he reveals to us, even though it's something to help us, it's always on God's heart that he reveals his son with that thing. So you, you see just a little bit of Christ. Um, now, in, if we get to some examples of God revealing his son, if you're, if you're in like Matthew 3, there's when Jesus gets baptized, kind of heaven opens up, or at least the noise of heaven opens up. And God's just like, this is my, you know, as the, as the dove comes down, as the Holy Spirit comes down, looking like a dove flying and landing on him, God speaks. And it seems like people heard this. And he says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That's a revelation. But that, that desire of God to reveal that, not everybody caught it. Even though people might have heard that, they were just like, that was weird, you know. But John the Baptist He's sitting there on the side. Actually, he's like a foot away from Jesus, soaking wet, just baptized him. And he says in John 1, I mean, yeah, he's quoted in John chapter 1. He said, I didn't know who it was, you know, who the Messiah was going to be. I didn't know. But, but God had told him when he sees the Holy Spirit coming down upon him, that's the one. So even though John the Baptist at first was like, I can't baptize you. You're like more righteous than me. And Jesus is letting him know, like, we have to do this for righteousness sake. Baptize me. So he's like, okay. But when the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus, he knew, like, this is the Lamb of God. This is the Messiah. That's when he knew it. And he explains that in John chapter 1. But so when that voice comes and says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, like, someone like John the Baptist, whose heart is very open to God, catches it. The revelation comes to him. And then he is holding on to that package. Now, he's got to wait some time because Jesus is whisked away to the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And he's, you know, he's fasting and he's tempted by the devil and he returns from that. And then he walks by as John's still baptizing people to repent. You know, and John's been for like over a month, like, wow, like just contemplating what happened. 
Uh, and you know he he can't re he can't watch what's happening in the wilderness. He has no idea, you know, but this hidden thing going on with the temptations. But then Jesus shows back up, and Jesus walks by, and he's got all his followers who have repented, and they've all been baptized, and their their hearts are very you know they've made a straight path in their heart, ready for the Messiah, ready for the kingdom of the heavens. And then Jesus walks past, and he's able to say, just the simple gospel message, like behold the Lamb of God. Now they they hear it, and they and they're like. Whoa. And you know what you have to do is you have to behold. You have to like, when God wants to reveal something, you have to pause. You have to contemplate. You have to take a moment and slow down. You can't, you can't think or talk as fast as we were going last night. You have to like step back and just be like, wait a second. The Lamb of God? I, you know, who knows what they were thinking of? These Jews who know all kinds of stuff about lambs of God and know all kinds of stuff about Passovers. And whatever they were thinking, like, okay. Like, and then the next day, just his gospel message just like added a half sentence. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And as he said that, now like a couple of the, uh, the disciples of John, they leave John, which is what they were been preparing for. It's no offense to John. And they leave him. And they start following Jesus. And Jesus turns around and he's like, what are you seeking? And they say, where do you live? And he said, come and see. And they, what happened was, as he said, behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world, revelation came to them. They saw him. They had beheld him. Now, John, the apostle, describes this beholding in verse 14, chapter 1, verse 14. He says, you know, the word became flesh. He dwelt among us. He became a human. And we have beheld his glory. We have contemplated his glory. We took a step back and we stared at him, spiritually staring. And the eyes of our heart was opened up. And we saw the glory of an only begotten with the Father, full of grace and truth. That is when God reveals something. There's a bit of beholding that happens, that needs to happen. So even as we, you know, we're reading verses, we're, we're talking this weekend, we're getting into things of God's purpose, but also all of us together are sometimes just taking a, a seat back and it may be something that catches you. And our prayer is, God, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Open up the eyes of my heart. It's something to understand some of this teaching. It's a good thing. It's a helpful thing to even to understand. For example, you may understand that what God's doing in all creation is not just about me. It's a really helpful teaching to understand. You can find a lot of verses about that. It's not only all about me. God didn't, like, it's true as far as the largeness of the love of God. It, you could say, like we say sometimes, like, Jesus would die on the cross if it was just you. As far as, like, how much he loves you, like, this is like a true statement of the expression of his love, of the depth of his love, of how much he knows your name, how much he knows you and died for you. But in another sense, you'd say, actually, what he's doing on the cross is way beyond just me. Like, I'm so glad to have a small part in this huge purpose of God. This is really helpful to know. It kind of pulls you in a right direction out of, your, out of yourself. But even with that, the prayer has to be right now, and it, and it has to be with me, even as we're talking about these things, that the Lord opens our eyes. So even as we handle the word of truth, like enlightenment comes to us. Even if it's just a little, that we see something beyond. And you take a step back and you see his purpose from eternity is all bound up in his son. And suddenly that thing that you've kind of known in the back of your heart, as you love Jesus, as you sing a worship song and you get swept up into worshiping him, suddenly you realize this is why it's so special whenever I behold Jesus, because it's the most special thing to the Father. This is why it's so wonderful when he shows me Jesus, when he shows me Christ, when I confess Jesus as Lord, because the, the, the heart of God is touched. And he says, yes, that's it. That's what I'm after. This is what I want you to see. This is what I want you to hear. But sometimes you have to kind of take that step back. You have to come to a weekend away from your normal practices. This is a great, great time to be together. Away in the mountain. This is kind of a little mountain right here. 
for this septic tank, right? <laughs> uh, for example, even though Peter had had some revelation in, in uh, Matthew 16, in Matthew 16, and Jesus said, this is from the Father. But then he, in, in the next chapter, 17, in Matthew 17, Jesus grabs Peter and James and John, and they go up to the mountain, just, the, just these four. And as they're there, in a sense, heaven rolls back. Now, actually, you know, in Christ is everything, right? Even as he's walking on the earth, the eternal word of God that's always been there from the beginning, all creation came through him. If you read John 1, he is like with God in the beginning, and he was God, and this is, this is the word of God. He comes and he dwells among us, and if you stare at him, it's like, what did I just see? Like, as you, as you behold him, you see, like, the glory of the only begotten son. But there's even more glory to behold of him. He was, like, hiding his glory in a sense. Or you could say, like, God was helping him hide his glory. Now, he's, he's a man, a real man, walking around. But in there is the king of glory. In there is the creator of all creation, walking around. And in him was the light of all mankind. So just barely people saw like a slight ray of light as he walked up to mankind. And those who saw just a tiny ray of light, they're like, oh, I better walk away from him. Because when he shines, like my sins are exposed. So men loved darkness rather than light. This is what actually happens. Jesus is walking around and he's not shining all of his light. He's not slaying everyone with his light of his glory. It's just like a little bit kind of slips out here and there. It's just, he sneezes and a little light ray comes and suddenly... You know, someone over here just got saved, like, glory. And then someone else is like, I got to go. Sorry. I have to go to the bathroom. You know, um, one thing, you know, this, is, this happens, like, when you have, like, a purposeful gospel message and you have most of the room is, like, unbelievers, you really have to lock the door. Because the last, <laughs> the last 20 minutes, it's like everyone gets diarrhea or something. They just have to go to the bathroom. It's because somebody, sometimes the light of the gospel starts to shine. You start to wiggle around. You're like, I Maybe I should go to the bathroom. Like, this doesn't feel right. My, is it my tummy stirring around? It's like, no, it's your conscience. Like, stay. Like, let the light shine. Anyway, so it says, like, in John 1, like, he's the... Cr Here we go. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Dude, I'm totally joking. I, I, it's okay. No, you're, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> so the, the creator who he came to his own, like it says in John 1, and his own didn't receive him. Now that's what's happening as he's like, in all this glory, he's the creator. His own creature is like running from him. And then it does say, whoever did receive him, you know, whoever received him, those ones he gave the right to be children of God. They got born again, born of God. So, and then that glory started to show. All right, so that's what's happening. Now as that's happened and glory has come to them and they've seen him as the son of God, there's more glory to be revealed. And so on, on this mountain, Jesus suddenly, as he's there, and he's in his normal outfit, this is just a normal guy, pretty cool outfit, um, <clears throat> it starts shining in this brightness beyond like what we're used to. In this like Shekinah glory of God, this kind of brightness that you can barely look at and keep your eyesight. And they, they see this, and then suddenly, and, and, and um, actually, you know, they kind of fall asleep. Um, and, and, but then as they wake up, they see like in his, in his majesty. Now it's described as majesty. Uh, Peter describes it actually. He describes like the majesty of, of that, the vision that he saw in all majesty. If, if you're in like second Peter, he's like, we're not telling you about his kingship or about his kingdom as if, as if it's some like mere teaching or something that, that, you know, we've just made up. He's like, we saw his kingdom. We saw his majesty on the mountain. This is what Peter says later in life. He's like, we saw it. And he's talking about what happened in Matthew 17. So his majesty is revealed and they see the king, the king of kings. I mean, they see the king of the kingdom of heavens. They see the king in some of his kingly glory as it will be in the future. According to God's purpose, it's all bound up in him. It's still there. God just for a moment was having a moment with his son. He's like, let's go ahead and wear your normal outfit. And his glory was shining. And these normal guys who had just seen a little bit of his glory as the only begotten son of God, who's the lamb of God, who can take away their sins. Now it's like, whoa, he's also the king of all glory. And he's like, everything's going to be about Christ. And then suddenly as they're seeing that, 
and then and then they fall asleep and then they 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 look up and they see Moses and Elijah um you know Peter opens his mouth as he's beholding the glory of of the son of god and and he's like hey i have a good idea let's make some tents let's stay here on the mountain this conference can go on for a while because this is the best and <clears throat> it's really it really makes sense to me and then <clears throat> so what God does, though, and this always happens when he's revealing Christ to us, this is at least what God really wants to do. Now, I think what you can do is, like, hang on to Moses' feet or hang on to Elijah's, like, um, or Moses' staff, Elijah's, I don't know what you'd hang on to with him. His what? Rope? His mantle. Oh, that's good. All right. I'm going to steal that. Hang on to his mantle. I just stole it. Um, you're hanging on to these guys. All right, but, but he doesn't do it. God makes it, uh, you know, if God like takes them away, you just can't hang on them long. So God removes them. And he says the same thing that he said in Matthew 3. He's like, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then he, said, he adds something. He's like, listen to him. It's almost like, you need to obey him. You just saw his majesty. Now like, let Jesus be your Lord. So sometimes with vision like this, or like God revealing something, there is... There is like, based on what he revealed, there's something for us to do. There's something like that. Sometimes it slays you. Sometimes it is just, a, it feels like a little more minor, but it's like, whoa, Christ. So don't dismiss the smallest revealing of Christ. Treasure it. There's the unsearchable riches of Christ. And as we're searching out and as we're finding him, sometimes there might be something major. There's like, whoa, I need a moment. And somebody's trying to talk to you like, hold on just a second. And he was like, uh, and then, and you know, and then maybe you can talk to them. Um, <clears throat> but when that, when all that's happening, it may change your life. It's meant to change our lives. That's why he prays this prayer that you don't merely get the teaching, that you don't merely like understand something new about like, okay, there's a bigger picture now. Like that's helpful to know. It's more like God reveal Christ, reveal, reveal something. Open the eyes of our hearts that we would see him in his glory, that we would see who he is. So whether we know it or not, just by being born again, a taste of that revelation has happened. Without the father revealing his son, you would not be born again. But God has revealed him. Now, when I, when I was first saved, I didn't even know that he had revealed Christ. I just knew like he showed me some aspect of his grace. Like if I pray this prayer, if I pray and, and uh, repent of my sins, It'll actually work because Jesus really died for me. I, it's like I saw a taste of his work on the cross, but it wasn't that I saw the face of Jesus really. But I did see Christ just barely. And I didn't understand it, but as I got born again and I started following him, and then, you know, I was reading the Paul's letters, but then when I started to read the Gospels, I was like, oh, Jesus, Jesus is awesome. And uh, Jesus, like, like, I started seeing Jesus. And one time I was, I was uh, this was within the first year of being saved, we, me and the other high schoolers, we, we um, decided to read the Bible in one week. And so we had like an, an all-nighter. It was during the summer, right? So we called it Crave, like, like newborn babes crave the word. And so we all got together in a barn, like a little larger than this. And day and night, you know, we're all in our pajamas and whatever. And we rotated. So it wasn't like all of us stayed the whole time. Some people did, but they were smelling. But anyway, we, we were there. And we were there. And sometimes you had shifts. And someone would be up at the mic. And they would read the scripture out loud. It was so cool. And you would listen. And, you know, we had to get certain guys to read parts of the Old Testament because none of us could pronounce the names right, you know. So we got like a Hebrew guy to do that, you know. And, but anyway, as we did this, we got to this point. Now, I had been saved for a little bit, and I was making discoveries of his, the riches of his grace. And I was finding that I really loved him who loved me. But then we were, we were um, there was this old, um, like, move, like, video of Matt. It was, it was called Matthew or the Matthew series or something. And it was like straight scripture, NIV scripture, and they just acted out the scripture. But we played that at the, the moment of the cross. And so I was watching this, and all of us were watching this. And Jesus was there on the cross, and he's, you know, he has suffered, and he's saying the words that he says in the book of Matthew. But I can tell you, something unlocked in the eyes of my heart right then. And even though I had, in a sense, seen Christ, this was my first glimpse of the real face of Jesus. And as I was just sitting there and we were watching this and I beheld him on the cross, like I was overwhelmed because I saw Jesus. And it was like, even though everything up to that point, I'd learned things about my salvation. It had been so good. 
But now I just saw Jesus, and it was like God took away Moses and Elijah from me. And he's like, here's my son. And I just loved him because I saw him. But it was, I know all of us saw the film. All of us saw the actor. And all of us were hearing the scriptures. But as I'm there hiding, like in the room, like I'm just pouring out in tears. And I just, I saw Jesus. And I can remember it. And I remember it was like I touched something way beyond what I had learned. Because I touched the person. That's when the teaching or the understanding like lifts up. And God reveals his son. This is why we pray this way. Because it's all bound up in Christ. And then I beheld, I beheld Christ. And you know, it, it like affected me. Like it, it, just, it just changed a few things. A few things that maybe I was struggling with, they were so easy to drop. They were just gone. It was like, but, but um, and you know, I, I don't even remember all that happened. All I remember is Jesus. I just remember that. Now there's, there's stories in the Bible of people who have visions of God and they're just, if you know like the story of um, Isaiah in Isaiah chapter six, as he sees inside of the temple, he's just undone. And he, he kind of, he's just like, I'm an unclean man with unclean lips. This is a prophet of God that's been telling everybody to get right and stuff like that. And he's like, he's just like, he's just finished. I'm with a bunch of unclean people because he saw God in his glory. But then, you know, the, the coals of fire come and touch his lips. And this is the way the Lord does it. Whatever the revelation is, whether it's really big like, like Isaiah's or it's just something simple, if you see Christ, the Lord wants to cleanse you. He wants to open your mouth. And then as you see, like the Lord wants to do something and to say something. It's, it's actually Isaiah who's like, like, here am I, send me. The Lord's like, there's some people, who's gonna, who am I going to send? And even though he just was saying, like, I'm just so unclean and my lips are unclean, I've been surrounded with unclean, now his lips have been burned with, the clen with cleansing fire. And he's just like, Lord, send me. It's like, despite me, just send me so somebody gets sent because you need to be shared. Like, this has to be shared. So this, this type of revelation has to come from the Lord himself. And when it happens, some bit of us is undone. It does not matter how well you're doing today. You're a little bit undone. It, you might not even call it this. You might just be like, you're a little bit upgraded. You know, you don't even know that the blood just cleansed you, but it just did. Because you like a little bit of darkness just faded away as, as the blood cleansed you and you saw more of Christ. Like this is what's meant to happen. Now, <laughs> I felt like I just, you know, I had prepared slides and I had prepared more clarity to explain things. And I want to just say a few things that I think are helpful for me to, to remember these things. But I don't want to go too far with it because I actually just wanted to testify of a re revealing of Christ. But in, if, so just really brief of something that maybe can help us to remember a little bit of God's purpose. If you're looking at God's purpose from your perspective, this isn't a bad thing. This is a God thing. For example, if you read in Romans uh, chapter 8, looking at it from your salvation and you're going to be justified and you're going to be sanctified and, and uh, you're actually going to be glorified though as well. And when it's, when it's shown, there's kind of a famous verse uh, describing in Romans 8 about how God is working all these things for good, for those that love God and for those that are called according to his purpose. Now, that's kind of, that's kind of, you know, I mean, I memorized it first. I did Romans 8, 28 verse, I mean, part A. And then later I had to upgrade that and add part B. And I was like, oh, it's for those who love God. And I was like, add C. And I was like, oh, and they're called according to his purpose. Like, now I get it. It's according to, yeah, okay. So, but right after that it says in verse 29, whom he has foreknown. This is that like, you know, he did that will thing way back when. He knew about you way back before creation. He also has predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. So he should be the firstborn among many brethren. So just to simplify this description, according to God's eternal will, looking at it from your perspective, God's will is that you would be conformed to the image of his son. He's using everything in your life to work for this purpose. He has loved you. You love him back because he first loved you. And now he's working even the hard things, even the wonderful things, 
He's working it all for one purpose, to conform you to the image of his son. That way, the only begotten son of God becomes the firstborn among many brethren. And in that chapter 8, he's like, all creation is actually groaning right now, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. So what he's doing is he's conforming you to the image of Christ is he's revealing the son of God in you. And then there's all these sons of God that will be revealed as we get conformed to the image of Christ. Man was made in the image of God and God's bringing that full circle to its actual purpose. You were meant to shine Christ. You were meant to express the glory of God and it is a glorious thing. Like that's how you were created to be. So that's from man's perspective and it's a right perspective. There's another perspective, which is <clears throat> what the book of Ephesians has kind of been majoring on. Um, and, and I think we'll get into it later, uh, later tonight more. Um, but it's from the perspective of this largeness of what God's doing among all of us. You could say that God's purpose is, or as this mystery of his will is revealed, his purpose has to do with Christ and the church. But it's not just Christ and this church. What's going on is he's, he's doing this thing with the glorious church. Uh, you know, even as he's describing to husbands to love their wives and wives to submit to their husbands and so on, he says, I'm actually talking about a mystery. He goes on to talk about how Christ gave himself for the bride, for the church. And he's like, what I'm talking about is the glorious church. He, washes, he is washing her with the water of the word. And he's going to present himself, the bride, spotless. So actually, most all these parts of the book of Ephesians, it keeps getting into the church and how you see the body growing up to the head. You see the house of God. You see all these things. And what God's expressing in the book of Ephesians is that Christ is meant to shine or to be fully expressed through the church. So like, like we would talk about, there's the head and then there's the body of Christ, which is the church. And that body of Christ is meant to actually be so connected to the head. And God's purpose in creation, one thing he's doing is he wanted a bride for his son. When God had this will that he decided to do all creation for, he saw, kind of like God said about Adam, like it's not good for him to be alone. And he wanted to not just make some creatures that would entertain, but to also do the height of creation, something that would be bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh, from the same material. So what he's doing in the church is he actually is creating, in Christ Jesus, he's creating us to leave the old things behind and just have the Christ things in us. So that's why if any man's in Christ, there's this new creation. That's why the church will actually be glorious, all glorious. Now, I, we'll mention more about that, but I just want to say, like, when we talk about God's eternal purpose, you could also say his eternal purpose is the Christ, or it is Christ in the church. It's that he wanted this church experience. If you go to the very end of the Bible, this is what you see with the New Jerusalem coming down. This is what God has been after. This is what he's working toward. And then <laughs> from creation's perspective, or you could say another thought from God's heart, or if we were to take a step back and we're outside of God and we're outside of creation, we're just looking at this thing. As he creates everything and there's a fall of, of angels and there's a fall of mankind, and he ends up making everything right and redeeming at the cross and maturing us and bringing us into something and saving us and saving us and totally saving us. And then he actually defeats his enemies in the end. If you were to take a big step back and you see at the very end, and you go to the very end of the Bible, all creation suddenly is like new. And in its newness, it's all summed up in Christ. And so like we read in Ephesians 1, one thing he's doing, one thing of God's purpose is to sum up all things in his son. One reason the father wanted all of this creation, and you know, the whole Godhead had to agree to this. The son had to agree, like, I will be the lamb that's slain. I'm willing to do this. But it was on the father's heart that all creation would shine Christ, would shine the son of God, would, would just sum up into Christ. The heavens and the earth, everything. This is why all creation was created through the word of God, through the son of God, because all of it's coming back to him. You'll find a lot of verses talking about this. So sometimes when we talk about God's eternal purpose, you can say his purpose is for his son. His purpose of all things is just Christ. So there's like a lot said in that, but that is, that is one way to remember. So you can say, I'm to be conformed to the image of Christ. Christ is to gain his bride. It's like this, this shiny, this, this 
help make this body of Christ. Or you could say like all creation. Now this is where it gets beyond us. You know, the first two are easier for us. But the other one is like everything. Everything in heavens or earth are to shine Christ. If you guys are, are um, willing to, to bear with me, can I have 10 more minutes? Is that okay? I don't know when I started. I'm sorry, guys. I just wanted to share. Is that okay? All right. All right. You, all right. I just want to say something like about God revealing something to us and it, it changing our lives <clears throat> and how our prayer for revelation is because God really wants to do something. Now, I had um, been following the Lord, and I just want to testify this, so that as a Christian and walking with the Lord for some years, the Lord kept revealing treasures of His grace. Um, I was searching these things out, and I had seen Christ, like I, I was talking about earlier. I had, seen, I had seen the face of Jesus, in a sense, spiritually speaking. It wasn't like some weird thing. It was just like, wow. And like I was captivated, and I love, I love the Lord Jesus. And... In my pursuit, in my pursuit, I wanted to give the Lord everything, and I wanted Jesus to be my Lord a hundred percent. And as I'm serving the Lord, you know, they, they wanted to. They, people started slapping titles on me and other things, and I was. Um, I ended up as an intern pastor, and and I was working and, and preaching in places. And I was often going to this denomination's headquarters, being in training and stuff like that. This is while I'm in college. And, and uh, during that time, the Lord just brought me deeper and deeper into following Jesus. And he started showing me and revealing Christ and revealing that some of my works were not part of the new creation. Some of my works were actually pretty carnal. And I started repenting. And I was like, Lord, I just want Christ. I just want Christ. And then one day, as I was at a pastor's training time, the Lord had been showing me something's wrong with my, my pride issue. And, you know, I was, I was growing in this denomination, and these were my people. These were my believers, and they were just so special to me. And I, I, I actually had made a discovery that the church is not the building. That was a big discovery. Like, the church is not this or, the organization. I had to tell you, I mean, we, we all went to church. And then it was just like, wait a second. As we keep reading the Bible, like the church is more. So we were reading like things like 1 Corinthians 12, and we're seeing like we're all body parts. Like the church is something more. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, he's like, there's many members of the body and there's one body, but this is the Christ. Like that, that started coming alive. I was actually doing workshops on it. I was teaching it. It's like we're the body of Christ. And we were accidentally experiencing church life. It was really cool. We were like illegally fellowshipping all the time, just like outside of church meetings, outside of Bible studies. You know, with other believers, we just get together and be like, what have you found of Christ? You know, like, let's read the Bible together just for fun. And we were doing this. We were actually churching it. And we kind of knew we were churching it. And it was really exciting. And then I was at this time, and I was just in my normal morning time reading the Word. And the Word came to me. And I, I'd been memorizing um, some scriptures. And I'd memorized the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Really cool thing to memorize. But then the Lord led me to re remember, to memorize the works of the flesh. It's not as fun to memorize. And, but part of the works of the flesh that shocked me was divisions among us. It's a carnal thing. I was like, this is a work of the flesh? Because I'm in a division, you know, technically a denomination. I was, we were kind of separated for different reasons. They're all, they're all divided, different reasons. But in my heart, it was like the Lord was working. So then I got to 1 Corinthians 1. And he's like, I heard from some from Chloe's household like there's divisions among you. And, and some of you guys say, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or Peter, or I follow Christ. And, uh, and he's like, was Paul crucified for you? This is also in chapter 3. Like, were you baptized in the name of Paul? But what God spoke to me, though, as I was, I was there in my morning time, I was like, you are carnal. He's, and, and in chapter 3, he's like, are you not still carnal when there's divisions among you? And he was just like, Jeffrey? You're carnal because you're all into your division. Now, I'm telling you, this is not a thing of, of revelation major. This is just a minor revelation of God speaking like you need to obey in something. So I'm at this pastor's conference and in our denomination and all these guys I really like and they most they all like me. And we and then they were sharing um, a joke at this conference. This uh, the lead guy was sharing. He had just been at an evangelical association with all these other denomination headquarters 
leaders, you know, Baptist, Methodist, all these different guys that are evangelical. And they, they all had this joke about light bulbs and how many Baptists it takes to change a light bulb. It's really cleverly done, just like describing each denomination and their quirks and their, their good things. And he got to our denomination and he shared, and all these guys are laughing. Now, they're all blameless. You know, they're all innocent. They're just, it's just a, a clever light bulb joke. Nothing wrong. But for me, and in my, in my spot, and, in, and, and the Lord had just spoken to me that morning, and as everybody's laughing at this light bulb joke, you know, we're all together and we're all men of God preaching and everything. I'm like, we should be doing something cooler than this. But the Lord's like, are you not still carnal? And like, it was like so loud to me. And so this, in obedience to the Lord, like I, I, I went back, I was traveling back with a pastor and I said, I've got to remove my name from the, the membership list. Like I'm a member in heaven, but I've got to stop being a member of the denomination. It was, it was just a big shock. It was a big life change for me. It was an obedience to Christ, though, that I needed to do. And so that, you know, that changed my career, my everything like that. And also my family I, that had gotten saved, I brought them in. You know, they were in this. My friends were in this. And because of my leadership spot, they asked me not to talk or fellowship with other believers in the, in the denomination. I could talk, but I couldn't talk about Jesus. <laughs> and you got to know, at this time, it was like, like, you just could not talk to me about the weather more than one sentence. It was like, you know who created that? You know, it's just like everything is, <clears throat> you're talking about football, and I'm just like, it's all going to burn. And, you know, so <laughs> whatever it is, I just had such a, such a weird attitude. So, so anyway, it was like, and my housemates, you know, I had like a dude's house, and we, we all fellowships, that illegal fellowship, but they're all in this denomination now. And I was like, I can't talk to those guys. And anyway, so this happened, and the Lord was so close to me. He was so near to me. And uh, things he had taught me about the cross or about being broken, it was like all coming alive because I couldn't talk to these believers. And I was like all alone. And I was just hiding. I feel, I feel like I was always reading on my knees, but I don't know. It's just how I feel like it was. I was hiding. I was reading the Bible. I was reading every book I could find that was like a treasure to me. And I was reading these things and searching the Lord and making little tiny discoveries. Now, now all my friends, you know, they're all getting warned, like, don't talk to Jeff Pittman because he's going to start his own denomination. Like the very thing I didn't want to do. So Katie Whitney, Catherine, my wife, she was up in New York, and uh, she was part of this denomination. So, they, you know, they came to her and warned her, like, watch out for Jeff Pittman. Uh, he's going to try to make a denomination out of all the young people. And so anyway, they, you know, all this was going on. Now, thankfully, I tricked her into talking to me later. Um, <laughs> so in this time, though, and I, I remember it like it was just like yesterday. I'm there on the floor, and the Lord had been so near to me personally just showing me his face, being near to me. Whatever suffering I was going through, it was like I was fellowshipping in the sufferings of Christ. Things I had heard about, but I'd never really done. It was just like, whoa, this is what it's like to know you in this way. It was so good. I can tell you. And it was just from obedience. But I had no idea what I was doing. All these different pastors were talking to me like, yeah, you can leave this and you're right. We're technically carnal in the division part. But what are you going to do? You can't do anything about it. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. But I just can't be... And in a division, because it's carnal. Like, I can just fellowship with believers. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to find some other believers who are just believers. I don't know what I'm going to do. They're like, you're just going to create another division. I was like, no, there's some way to do this. So I didn't know what I was going to do. Before I found out, like, that there's actually a way to just gather as believers and gather in his name, before I found that out, I was, in, I was reading a scripture in Ephesians 5, where he's like, I'm talking about a mystery. It's the glorious church of Christ in the church. I'm talking about this mystery. And this was really my first touch of like actually seeing something from eternity. And I got into the descriptions in, in uh, Revelation 21 and 22. And if you haven't read those recently, like go there and read what's going to happen. Because it's a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. And I saw the Lamb of God and his bride coming down and she's shining and she's all glorious and he's all pleased. And the wedding, the bride, is, you know, not only the bride has made herself ready, but the wife of the Lamb comes down. And it's just like so wonderful. Now, this is a city, the New Jerusalem. But you see, it's all Christ. And in the light of the whole city, the light of everything is like not the sun. It's actually the lamb. And he's in the center. And there's no temple because like this whole thing has his presence. It's all his house. And he's right there. Like you can actually see him and you can actually touch him. And not only that, but the, the, the stones you know, we, and I knew the scriptures, like, we are like living stones built together, like we're a, a habitation for God. This is when it literally happens. And the stones are gold, but they're not normal gold. 
They're see-through gold. And they, so if they're see-through gold, this is what I was catching. It's like, and I, just, I don't know how to describe it, except that I saw the, the gold was transparent. And I saw the shining of Christ in the center, shining right through the stones. And I saw Christ was in the stones. And I saw that was the Christ. And because he could shine all the way through and there was no extra colors and there was no extra dirt, it was like all the Christ. And I saw the church was glorious. I saw the glorious church that is on his heart. And he said, this is my church without spot or wrinkle. It's not what you think it's been. It's no one according to their flesh. In the very end, they're all going to look like this. And it's going to shine my son. It was almost like God saying, you know, to the disciples, like, this is my son. Listen to him. He was just like, this is it. This is the church. And I just sat back and I saw this glorious church and the eyes of my heart were opened up. And it wasn't a separate thing from Christ. You've got to know the glory was the glory of Christ. That was what undid me. It wasn't like, okay, he's going to build his church and he's going to make it better and better. It was like nothing like that. It was like as they all get conformed to the image of Christ, then suddenly you put them all together as God's been doing as he's building his church. You just have like Christ and Christ and Christ and Christ and you have this overwhelming glory that all creation is looking at. And the centerpiece of all creation is the new Jerusalem. The centerpiece is the lamb. And this new Jerusalem is expressing the lamb like nothing else could. And he has, she's bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. She's one with him. And the two become one flesh, become one thing. You have Christ and you have the glorious church right there. And as I saw that, I just sat back because I remember I was on the floor and I was, I was looking into this and I was, I, was, I was discovering this. And I said, this is it, Lord. Like, I was like, nothing. I, I don't want anything else. It's like, this is what I want. This is what I'm after. Lord, I just want to see this. And you, you got to know, like, what it all happened to me was because of trying to obey about the church. But I had no idea about the church. But I saw something way beyond what I was asking. I was like, how, God, how do we do the church? How do I do this and not start a new division? How do I do this the right way? and be one with all God's people. And God said, like, he just dropped all my questions. He just removed Moses and Elijah suddenly. And it wasn't about my practice or how we were going to go forward or anything. It was just like, look what I'm doing. And when I saw that, it was like, all my questions were answered. If anything has to do with that glory, that's what I'm about. I want to see that glory. If, we, if it has to be in some limited way right now with whoever I can find, as we can, like I, I found in, in, <clears throat> in 2 Timothy 2, like just pursue with whoever's calling on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. You know what you're pursuing is that glorious future. And like just keep finding believers like you believers that we can pursue the Lord together. But that heavenly vision, that, that purpose of God, that mystery of Christ in the church changed my life. And whenever the Lord reveals himself to us, it's meant that we take a step back and he works inside of us. We have our lips cleansed. We have our hands cleansed. We have our heart cleansed. And then the Lord, based on that, on that revelation, he also says, go, let's do this. Well, let's, let's pray together and, and look to the Lord together to reveal his son in us afresh. Lord, we come to you with our hearts trembling before you, Lord. We want to see Jesus. Lord, I pray for all of us that the eyes of our hearts would be opened up. Lord, we've all seen you, and we want to know you more, Lord. We pray that you would open up our eyes. We pray that heaven would be rolled back. We pray that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down and fill this place and fill our hearts with the glory of the only begotten. Lord, we pray that you would fill us in areas in our hearts that haven't been filled yet. We pray that you would strengthen us in the inner man, that we would be able to walk in the steps that you're calling us to. We pray that you would fill our mouths, that utterance would be given to us as we open our mouths, that we can boldly make known the mystery of the gospel. Lord, we commit ourselves to you. We worship you and we fix our gaze on you. In Jesus' name, amen.